Hi, my name is Adam Lee, and I'm a third year bioengineering student here at UCSD. And this summer, my project was to study the feasibility of 3D deformation and strain analysis using microcomputed tomography. <clears throat> now, that sounds like a word full, but uh, I'll give you some, a brief background uh, to understand my project. So, measurement of strain in three dimensions is useful to assess the biomechanical function of various tissues, such as your heart, your cartilage, or your muscles. Now, microcomputed tomography is an x-ray based imaging system that <clears throat> can take snapshots of 2D image slices and essentially give you 3D information uh, on the micrometer level scale. So it's really precise and accurate and it can be used to track really tiny details. Now hydrogels are really important to the study as well. Now hydrogels can be created with a variety of different material properties, but previously, however, they've only been studied in 1D and 2D. So our hypothesis here is basically to that the micro CT of hydrogels created with radio opaque particles can be analyzed under compression to assess 3D deformation and strain with high resolution. <clears throat> And to test this hypothesis, our objectives are to create hydrogels with radio-opaque particles and evaluate, one, the particle size suitable for visualization, and two, to determine the axial and radial deformation and strain under both confined and unconfined compression. <clears throat> now, in order to test these objectives, uh, first we started off with creating the hydrogels. So our hydrogels were created with 3% agarose in phosphate buffered saline with 0.1% radio opaque particles. Now, the, the gels were essentially created into disks with a height of three millimeters and either a diameter of three millimeters or 6.2 millimeters, depending on the compression type. Uh, as you can see in table one, these were all the experimental groups that we tested uh, with <coughs> uh, particle size, background particle size and compression type. Now, the samples that we compressed, uh, we compressed to 30% over approximately 150 seconds or and 300 seconds respectively for both 15% and 30% compression. So basically we performed two compression steps. And during each uh, compression step, we allowed the samples to be uh, just lay there in the micro CT for 30 minutes because <clears throat> to, we wanted the equilibrium to be reached inside the hydrogel. And this would ensure that we had an accurate reading on the strain deformation. Now, when we moved on to our image analysis, we segmented our 3D micro CT images into different grayscale thresholding ranges. And because of that, we separated the particles from the background, essentially, the hydrogel background. Uh, we focused on the 3D centroid positions of the different particles and to, we looked throughout the depth of the hydrogel, such as <clears throat> in this picture, you can see a schematic of the hydrogel inside the compression chamber and we took particles throughout the hydrogel and we tracked them, uh, such as in this figure where you can see similar formation of particles going from 0% compression to 15% compression to 30% compression. <clears throat> now, particle composition was determined with centroid variability uh, between thresholding bins, which means we were looking for the standard deviation of how these particle positions change with different thresholding ranges in order to determine whether or not this actually was accurate enough or high enough resolution for us to use in future studies. <clears throat> now, for the lowest uh, variability particle size, we determined the axial and radio strain behaviors. And in order to determine that, we compared compressed position against initial position. So, as you saw earlier in figure one, uh, this would be an, our initial position, these four particles. But then when they compress to 15%, 30%, their mov movements would be the displacement. <clears throat> and after we 
found that data, we fit the <clears throat> displacement versus position to a linear regression, and the slope of that would be the strain of that compression. Now, the statistical measures that we took were, essentially to sum it up, the standard deviation of the particle centroid position due to different thresholding ranges, and two, the standard error for the estimates of the slopes from regressions. So essentially, we were looking for whether or not our measurement of strain was accurate or not. And the third one was our student's t-test of strain from the regression slope and our expected imposed strain. So whether or not this matched up with our 15% compression and our 30% compression. And these are all tested with a p-value of uh, 5%. <clears throat> so over here in our results section, you can see that uh, we determined that hydrogels containing 40 micrometer particles approach micro CT resolution of only 2 to 4 pixels. So as you can see in figure 3, this is a, a 40 micrometer hydrogel in, uh, with 2D sections. So it basically shows a 3D kind of view of the hydrogel. And then here's the 80 micrometer uh, hydrogel. So as you can see, it's distinctly different in the appearance of the particles, whereas the, the 40 micrometer particles was, you could barely see it, the 80 micrometer particles had a much higher resolution of 79 pixels. Now, the 80 micrometer particles also showed the smallest standard deviation from different thresholding ranges of 0 0.616 micrometers. So that's really small, so we can be sure that a thresholding range that we choose is accurate enough to track the strain deformation behavior. Uh, we, since we also tested that adding the 20 micrometer particles increased the background attenuation by 5.3 percent per millimeter relative to the 80 micrometer particles without the 20 micrometer background. So essentially what the 20 micrometer background, 20 micrometer particles essentially did was all, it just made the hydrogel brighter overall. So this would be useful in future studies. <clears throat> Uh, so over here, we have our graphs. Uh, on the bottom of figure four is our 80 micrometer particles uh, analyzed in unconfined and confined compression for <clears throat> axial strain, which is in the direction of compression. And over here is in radio strain. Uh, so <clears throat> the linear regression of the unconfined compression experiment uh, showed that we had a strain of 13.7% and 31% for 15% and 30% compression, respectively. And the linear regressions were statistically significant with a p-value of approximately zero. So uh, also the R-square values were very high. One was 0 0.95 and 0 0.98. Uh, for the linear regression of the confined compression experiment, we had a strain of 6.1% and 17.6% for the 15 and 30% compression, respectively, again. Uh, the linear regressions there were also statistically significant, and the R-square values were 0 0.98 and 0 0.97. So as you can see here, uh, the graphs all looked pretty linear, and things, the R-square values were really high. So we show that there was a linear cor uh, relationship with the displacement and depth from the surface. So over here is our radio strain analysis. And what happened here was that our linear regression wasn't uh, very statistically significant. And our R-square values were 0 0.45 and 0 0.47. And our p-values were 0 0.23 for both. So it didn't quite turn out the way we wanted it to. But <clears throat> in order to analyze these results, I want to just sum up some of the key points that were made before. So first, we showed that the 40 micrometer sized particles were too small for tracking since they only approach resolution of 2 to 4 pixels. And that's too small to accurately display and to accurately track. Now, the 80 micrometer particles had a small standard deviation in particle position. So we know that our thresholding range is accurate enough to track 80 micrometer particles. And also, adding the 20 micrometer particles increased background attenuation enough to help in future studies say 
we might be interested in testing cartilage and in order to test cartilage perhaps we want to use a hydrogel and test it with the uh, cartilage. In order to distinguish the hydrogel from the cartilage, the 20 micrometer background attenuation would be useful. And also, the strains for unconfined compression definitely did match expected values and demonstrate feasibility of hydrogel compression. Uh, as you remember, that it was 13.7% and 31% for 15 and 30% respectively. Now, the strains for confined compression were lower than expected, but this could have been due to friction at the confining wall surfaces, as you remember from the schematic in figure two. Uh, over here, where the hydrogel and the <coughs> confinement, confining wall touch, they could have produced friction that could have alleviated some of the strain felt by the hydrogel, and that could have been the cause of the low strain behaviors. Now, the radio strains showed weak linear correlation, and this could have been due to a variety of reasons. One was that there's a movement-dependent method of measurement of the gel center. So, in other words, the gel center we used as a reference position, but it was, a, it was moving throughout the compression, uh, as we found in several examples. Uh, first, in figure one and figure three, you can see in all the examples that the hydrogels have a slight skewed, um, I guess, shape, you would say. And because of that, your center would be moving diagonally as you move throughout the hydrogel when you pick different particles to analyze. So in order to alleviate that in the future, we are going to just pick a really small area in the hydrogel in the middle and analyze particles along that region. And because of that, the reference position should stay relatively the same, and we should expect linear correlation. And <clears throat> last but not least, I want to just summarize that we did show the feasibility of 3D deformation and strain analysis using microcomputer tomography. We obtained linear regressions for axial and radial strain analysis, and the axial strain analysis were definitely very good with very statistically significant results. And we are going to improve on the radio, <coughs> radio strain analysis results as well. And I would like to thank my lab, the Carlos Tissue Engineering Lab, Cal IT2, for giving me the opportunity to do this research this summer. And my PI, Dr. Robert Alsaw, and my mentor, Esther Corey, for all their help this summer. Thank you.